and I'm going to be looking at how workers seem to be responding to the decision to adopt right to work at a state level. And as uh, many are probably already aware, um, there's a Supreme Court case under um, a debate, and I think the announcement was some people were speculating that it would be this morning. Um, it would have been nice if it was this morning. It would have uh, dovetailed really nicely with this talk, but I think maybe Monday uh, or sometime next week it will be coming out. But it's essentially on this topic of is it um, okay for workers not to have to pay union dues if they don't want to participate in union activity. So let's get started. Um, I want to begin by providing an illustration of how right to work laws vary across states. And what this plot is just showing you is that the number of states, the fraction of states that have adopted right to work laws has really increased a lot over time. And about a, now a majority of states have right to work laws, which covers about 48% of the US population. So for example, California does not have right to work laws and California has a lot of people in the state and so that's one of the reasons why you see a slightly majority of, um, of, of states having it but it still covers only about 48 percent of the population now um, what I'm going to be asking in this research paper in this policy note is um, do workers actually like the adoption of state laws because you get very polarized views um, in the political spectrum when you ask people about this and just to provide a little bit of motivation I want to quote two uh, public figures Number one is uh, from uh, former President Barack Obama, and he had mentioned that um, these right to work laws have nothing to do with economics, that it's all about politics. On the other hand, um, President Trump has remarked that right to work laws are great um, because they're better for people. And um, to cut to the chase, I'm going to provide evidence in this paper um, that's a lot more consistent with the latter uh, view that this seems to be increasing worker sovereignty, worker choice, that workers like to have that option of whether they're going to pay union dues or not, um, and that there's very solid economic arguments for having right to work um, in, in the workplace. The conventional way that economists would answer this question is by saying, well, uh, right to work laws might be good for individuals and their well-being might increase, uh, but it's through more of a, a wage channel. So, for example, if, if you can win that right to work laws raise employment, they raise wages, then it would be maybe possible that workers would like that extra income, like that extra employment opportunity. What I'm going to provide in this paper is some additional evidence that workers like these right to work laws, not just because of their positive labor market effects, but also because it gives workers more discretion, more agency, as well as it improves the workplace practices that, that employees are actually living in. And so I'm gonna provide a little bit of suggestive evidence that there's less of an adversarial relationship between uh, employers and employees after states seem to be adopting these laws. I just want to mention, um, at, and so although this is going to be more of a policy-themed um, conversation, uh, and I'm going to present some of the quantitative results, there's a lot more in the paper. Um, these are actually remarkably robust results that I find that right-to-work laws raise uh, worker well-being and how people are reporting about their lives as well as their um, expectations about the economy. There's a number of different statistical estimators that I use to illustrate this result. Um, so let me just say now that uh, to the extent that anyone has questions about how I got to where I got um, with these results. I'm happy to go into more detail. I'm probably only going to focus on um, these uh, difference and difference estimates where I will compare union and non-union workers in states before and after they adopt these right to work laws. Because what's really nice in my sample is going to be that I observe states that didn't have right to work laws and then several years later they might adopt these laws. Let me provide a little bit of historical context, and I'll leave um, some of the history lesson to, to Price later today. Um, I only uh, have a novice uh, background in, in history, um, and I just want to point out one act that was really fundamental in uh, providing this exclusive access for collective bargaining agreements in 1930. Uh, for by FDR, there was this view that the Great Depression was caused because uh, there was too much competition. The businesses was were kind of overstretching their boundaries, and so FDR in the Wagner Act um, expanded the power that unions had to collectively bargain, and it gave um, exclusive rights for unions to represent those workers. And so even if a worker didn't really want to be represented by that union, they were still uh, seemingly forced by this by this law. And so it really expanded union power. It didn't really expand uh, worker agency. 
agency that much. And there's this notion of this mandated duty to bargain that once a union gets certified, the firm had to pretty much um, do everything within its power to uh, come to the negotiating table. And that was something that Diana mentioned earlier, um, that unions have quite a bit of power in the workplace. Uh, and then she was talking more about some recent laws, but uh, a big catalyst was this 1934 uh, legislation. Uh, in 1941, um, somebody named Riggle, William Ruggles in the Dallas Morning News uh, mentioned this idea of right to work, and it started catching on in the 1940s. More states adopted it, where it really gave workers that discretion that if they don't want to be part of the union and pay union dues, they don't they don't need to. And so it's just giving them that choice, that making that vol that mechanism voluntary. Where I'm going to focus most of the, the time in the next um, 20 or so minutes is probably on the, um, the, so talking about the main results and how I get there with some of the statistical evidence. So let me just provide maybe two minutes of background about the data that I'm going to be drawing on to make some of these um, inferences. There's um, a partnership that I have with uh, Gallup. Um, they have access to about a, 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 what's called the US Daily Poll. 1,000 people are surveyed every day, asked about their subjective well being, so how do they feel, um, what are their expectations about the future, as well as their economic sentiment, i.e., what do they think that the economy is going? Is it getting better? Is it staying the same? Is it getting worse? And so on. Um, I'm going to be able to see the geographic details, so where somebody is physically located, the county, the zip code, the state, of course, um, as well as a whole host of demographic factors that are going to be really useful for comparing similar types of people in a state over time. In addition to the Gallup data, I'm going to combine this with um, data from the Census Bureau and just information about where right-to-work laws are being passed, what states have them, when did they adopt them, and so on. And this is going to provide me with um, detailed information about the characteristics at a local level to make sure that I'm comparing similar types of locations over time, because you wouldn't want to compare two states that are fundamentally different and attribute some of the differences in well-being when there's just differences in the composition of workers that are present there. To give an illustration of where right-to-work laws uh, vary throughout the U.S., so just a spatial concentration, this is just a map that shows you in about 2017 what states had right-to-work laws, which ones didn't. So, for example, um, Arizona, where I grew up in Phoenix, um, we have right-to-work. California does not. Um, a lot of the states in the uh, upper northeast do not. And um, this provides a nice laboratory for um, an economist, a statistician, to really mine the data and understand how these differences in right-to-work work might be contributing to differences in subjective well-being and in economic optimism. The survey that I draw on, um, just to make very concrete what I'm going to actually be using from the survey, um, has several questions that um, ask about people's subjective well-being. Um, one question that I'm going to be drawing on heavily is this question about life satisfaction. And the way that the question is worded um, asks about this um, something called the Cantrell ladder. So it says, please imagine a ladder with steps um, numbered from zero at the bottom to 10 at the top. Um, and so basically 10 is the best possible life, and then zero is the the worst possible life, and it's asking, where do you fall on this ladder today? And so maybe if you ask people on different days, they'll fall on different spots, but the idea is that um, if you randomly select a person, that you're going to get a glimpse into their life satisfaction on that day um, about how, how their um, life is going. There's another question about where they think they're going to be in five years. So do they think that their life is getting better? Or is it getting worse? That's also going to provide some useful information. And lastly, there's two questions about perceptions about the national state of the economy. Um, this question is important because a lot of the views that we develop about the economy are based off of access to local information. It might be based off of a neighbor that loses a job or a neighbor that gets a job, and that's going to inform our views about how the economy is doing. I'm going to use all these questions um, in my statistical model to try to understand how people's beliefs, how people's subjective well-being is changing in response to the adoption of these state um, right-to-work laws. I'm going to spend uh, uh, probably three minutes or so just talking about this statistical strategy. Um, the simple model it just takes this outcome, y, at an individual level i, and at a state level s, and in a particular year, t. And it's just going to regress that variable on um, an indicator for whether or not the state has a right to work law. Um, that's going to be the indicator RTW. And the key parameter of interest is the gamma. And this is going to 
characterize the marginal effect of adopting right-to-work laws on subjective well-being, on economic sentiment. And then there's going to be a whole host of demographic controls um, about the individual in, in that variable XIT, and then another set of controls, um, DST, that are going to characterize the state demographic factors. And I'm also going to put in something called fixed effects um, in this eta S and lambda T term. And long story short, what this is going to do is make sure that I can compare the same person or is the same the same state over time. Although I don't observe people over time, that would be really annoying if you were getting a call every day from from Gallup and answering the phone and telling about how your life is doing. But these are different people every day, but it's within the same state over time, and that allows more um, closer comparisons um, in terms of the sample. So um, I'm going to estimate this statistical model, and the main coefficient of interest is going to be that gamma. The biggest concern with, with that regression, however, is that it could be that these states that are adopting right-to-work laws differ um, for, for various reasons and differ in a way that is changing over time. So it could be that a, a state adopts right-to-work because there's a new manufacturing base that moves into an area and they're maybe able to lobby um, for, for right-to-work. And so one, one exercise that I'm going to do is being uh, comparing people within the same state over time, in particular comparing union to non-union workers in the same state. Um, before and after. And so the way that I'm going to operationalize that insight is by modifying this statistical model just a little bit. And I'm going to be introducing an indicator UIT that's going to denote whether or not the person's in a union, uh, as well as the interaction between that union indicator and right to work laws. And then everything else in that regression is going to basically stay the same. The reason why this new model is going to be useful, and I'm going to provide both sets of results, is because it helps isolate um, what is uh, maybe more random fluctuations in the adoption of right to work laws in particular I'm going to just have I'm just going to have to win the assumption that um, these union and non-union workers would have been trending similarly in their in their subjective well-being had the state not adopted right to work laws so in other words if you could imagine an alternative universe where states did not adopt right to work laws would the union and non-union workers be moving in the same direction it doesn't mean that they have to be in the same level like a union worker might have a higher or lower subjective well-being but they just have to be moving in a similar direction had the right to work laws not been adopted. And that assumption, um, I'm not going to talk about today, but it's in the paper. Um, I, I validated it. It's called a parallel trends assumption. And it does seem to be holding up. So it means that this estimator is applicable um, in this sort of setting. Um, what I'm also not going to talk about um, in much detail today is the other approaches that I take to get very similar results, but I just want to highlight some of the exercises right now so that you're aware um, of the tests that were implemented. Uh, one is going to be controlling for other state level factors. So if you're concerned that the states that are adopting right to work are on an upward growth trajectory, one thing you can just do is control for um, state employment growth. You can control for the history of state employment growth. You might also be concerned that this this result is going to be driven by particular states, and so you can leave out certain states from the sample and then just estimate it on the others. I'm going to get very similar results if I do it that way. Um, there's a couple other um, what are called balancing estimators. Um, this is a fancy term just for describing if you can't find a perfect control state or a perfect control individual, you can take a function of characteristics like age, education, uh, race, and so on, and then construct a permutation across those characteristics and then match up a treated group, i.e. a treated state that gets right to work, with an untreated control state. So long story short, there's a lot of different statistical exercises that I go through that I'm going to skip over uh, for the sake of brevity uh, today, um, but I'm just going to get to kind of the main results now. So let me focus your attention on a couple of numbers. So there's a lot of numbers up here. Let me just draw attention to three of them. Uh, the first one is looking at the top left column where it says 0.037. The, the way to interpret this is that um, when the outcome variable is current life satisfaction and you regress that on right to work laws, life satisfaction goes up by about 3.7%. So it's saying that uh, if you take all the individuals in a state that um, are, are reporting um, this life satisfaction measure, it goes up by about 3.7 um, uh, units. 
And um, what's also interesting is that some people might say, well, these states just differ in a lot of uh, in a lot of ways. Maybe what you're picking up is the correlation between right to work and a lot of other unobserved, unseen characteristics. And so by comparing people in the same state before versus after, you maybe get a more um, a more random sample. And indeed, when you do that, you get that coefficient of 0 0.029, suggesting that um, these unobserved characteristics are not generating massive bias in the sample. It seems to be going at least in the same direction, and it's still very statistically and economically significant. But you might still be thinking, how to interpret this 0 0.029, especially when the outcome variable is in terms of, a, uh, of an index, because it's not in terms of dollars, it's not in terms of number of employees, like some variables might be measured in, it's an index. And so one way that's helpful for interpreting the magnitude of this coefficient is by comparing it with the magnitude of the coefficient on this indicator for college. And so um, if you just look at the um, uh, uh, kind of bottom left where you see 0.27 in, in the first column, um, that's saying that college degree workers have about 27% higher life satisfaction than their non-college counterparts. And so if you think about 0.037 uh, and just divide that by uh, 0.27, then you kind of get a proxy for, it seems to be that the adoption of right to work is mattering maybe like 10% as much as um, having a college degree, which you might think that's small or big, but it, I mean, in my opinion, that was actually quite sizable because you think about a college degree, that means you're going to have um, a more competitive, uh, you're going to be higher skilled, you're going to have access to more job opportunities. And so just the fact that your state is passing right to work gives a lot of people more autonomy. So I interpreted that as a relatively sizable um, coefficient. Um, and then lastly, which I'm not going to spend much time on now, um, these results come through even when you change the outcome variable to future life satisfaction. So how are people perceiving that their economy, their, their life is developing, um, as well as what they think about the economy, this, this measure of economic sentiment. So um, the, the synopsis here is that people's subjective well-being, their beliefs about the economy is improving quite a bit after the adoption of right-to-work laws. What I found really interesting, though, is not just because for me, I, I viewed that as maybe um, a, a common sense result that if you give people more choice, they're probably going to like that. Um, they don't want to be forced or coerced into paying union dues. But what I found more interesting was that this effect was concentrated among union members. And so if you step back and you think, Huh. So if a state adopts right to work, then maybe people that don't want to be in the union or are then going to leave the union um, or they don't want to be paying union dues, they don't pay union dues, maybe you would expect this effect to be concentrated among the non-union workers. And I spent a lot of time puzzling over, like, how, how does this make sense? And I'm going to provide some evidence shortly that it seems to be that the unions become a lot more competitive after the adoption of these laws. They're actually forced to deliver more value to the workers in the workplace because no longer are they just guaranteed that income stream. And so what this result is just showing you is that that increase in life satisfaction is concentrated among union members, demonstrated by the interaction between that indicator for right to work laws and the union indicator. So you can see that the coefficient is about 0 0.02. Um, and that's robust across a lot of different statistical estimators. You also Priestus, see let me interrupt yeah. just with a question. Does the union classification here, does that is that saying whether you're in a sector that's heavily unionized or that you are in fact a unionized this is worker. That you are in fact a union, uh, that you're in a union. One of the things I wanted to explore, but I, the Gallup data doesn't allow me to do so, is I can't see the industry that the person is in. So um, yeah, but this is an individual's union participation. Um, yeah, I'll come back to actually, you raised an important question that I hopefully, maybe, maybe, mean to interrupt yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I, I want to come back to that, that um, issue. Hopefully somebody raises the question, otherwise I'll mention it, because certain sectors that were highly unionized, you might expect a bigger or smaller effect. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, let me mention one other thing. So um, one other concern that people might have is that these states that are adopting right to work laws differ in other ways that are changing over the period of the sample. And so one thing that I apply is what's called um, a, a balancing estimator, which basically says, I'm going to try to match up the control states with the treated states as well as I possibly can by matching based off of other demographic characteristics. So if you think that um, the composition of workers in Indiana are changing a lot, and Indiana adopted right to work laws, I Somebody that's from Indiana might know this better than me. I thought it was like 2014. Does anybody know? Okay. Anyway, sometime between my samples, Indiana adopts uh, right-to-work laws, and the composition might be changing. And so when you apply this balancing estimator, it actually doesn't change the, the results much at all. It goes from uh, 0 0.094, for example, with economic sentiment, down to 0 0.077.
So uh, you might be thinking, how, does it, how should we interpret these regressions in terms of broader uh, types of regulations? And so one exercise that I went through was I took data from uh, Mercatus's Reg Data database. And what, what Mercatus does is they measure the number of restrictions at an industry level. And so I mapped restrictions at an industry level into restrictions at a county level by using the employment share of workers um, in that particular industry. So if uh, manufacturing is 10% of a county, I'm I'm going to map that industry restrictions into um, county restrictions based off of the employment share. And long story short, what I find here is that um, when I do a very similar regression, I take um, the subjective well-being, I regress that on the growth in regulations at a county level, I find that the growth in regulations is associated with a big decline in people's perception about how the economy is doing. And so this is kind of the classical um, uh, view that a lot of, um, I mean, libertarians, conservatives hold is that when regulations go up, um, it seems to be reducing economic activity. And it seems to be that people perceive that and their attitudes about the economy become a lot more pessimistic. So um, what I want to mention here is that these results are, are interesting about economic sentiment, but I didn't find really any results on life satisfaction. So it seems to be that right to work laws are very unique in and that it's not just economic sentiment that's changing, it's also people's uh, degree of well-being. And that's why I interpret some of these results in terms of an improvement in worker agency, that you give people more discretion, they have more autonomy, and as a result, they're going to be more engaged and excited in the workplace. So here's a big question. Are these effects just driven by composition? Is it just the case that people that are now not part of the union are different? And you might be thinking that the people that don't like being part of the union are going to leave after a state adopts right to work. And the people that stay in the union are the people that really, really love being in a union. So I'm going to provide two tests that suggest that this is not the case. And I'm going to provide a counter explanation for why I see the results that I do. Uh, the first exercise is going, and, and let me just mention that none of these exercises are going to be completely bulletproof, but I think that we're going to at least hone in on what's going on. So the first exercise is going to start out with this fact that unions, um, that union membership is larger in bigger companies and bigger establishments. And so um, they're, they're, if, if that's the case, which I validate using the current population survey and just show that at bigger establishments, there's a higher share of union, uh, union workers, and that's especially concentrated in the manufacturing sector, um, then couple that with the fact that if um, a state adopts right to work laws, then you would expect the, the firms that are responding more to it would be the bigger firms. Because if, if union members are concentrated in those bigger firms, then they should be the ones that are responding more. However, using the county business patterns, I find a statistically indistinguishable effect between the bigger and smaller firms, which at least suggests that if it was purely a composition effect, i.e. that um, there's a, a change in the types of firms that are operating at a state level, then you would expect there to be very different effects. I don't, I don't find that. A second exercise that I do is that if you think that um, it's the type of workers that are just selecting into um, a firm in a state that has right to work, then you would maybe expect differences in the types of characteristics of, of those workers. And I uh, particularly couple this with two, two facts that I explored. Number one is that in the panel study of income, so the panel study of income dynamics is a nice longitudinal study that the University of Michigan has conducted really since 1967. And so with that data set, I, I match up people over time. Time. So some people are in the sample for 30 years, some people in the sample for five years. And what I can show is that it seems to be that in the states that are adopting right to work laws, if anything, it's less productive workers that are selecting into the union. In other words, if a state adopts right to work laws and you have a choice not to be part of the union, well, the people that are becoming more active are probably the people that are, are maybe a little bit less productive. And so I validate that using the PSID. Uh, the second part to this is that um, I, in the Gallup data, I show that the less productive individuals also have lower life satisfaction. So if anything, you would think that the, the, that the effect of right to work laws concentrated among union workers would be associated with the decline in life satisfaction, not an increase. And so this at least pushes back against the hypothesis that it's just a composition based effect. So if it's not a composition effect, what, what is driving this result? And um, in a fuller presentation, I go into uh, more of the statistical evidence behind these two hypotheses. But for now, let me just basically sketch the idea idea of what I show in the paper. 
Uh, the first hypothesis is that the labor market is defined by things called compensating differentials, that if you're being paid a higher wage, then it must mean that there are other amenities in your job that you're not getting. Maybe it is uh, fewer perks, maybe it is fewer development and training opportunities, whatever the case might be, it's just saying that wages don't come for free. People cannot pay higher wages and then provide other amenities for free. And so um, what I find is that um, in the um, National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, which is an additional longitudinal survey that the BLS conducts, I find that workers in um, union jobs actually have a lot lower job satisfaction, even when you control for wages. And so even though they tend to have higher wages relative to their counterparts in similar jobs, they have lower job satisfaction. So what that tells me is that it must be that there's other amenities in these jobs that are not being provided, i.e. when a state adopts right to work, it could be that now employers have a greater incentive to train their workers instead of relying on the union to do that. And um, indeed, that there, that's what I find some suggestive evidence of. The second hypothesis is that there's more competition, that now when unions can't just get that steady income stream um, by fiat, they're forced to actually provide more valuable services to the workers. In other words, they have to explain what they're doing. They have to be more transparent about how they're actually helping the worker as opposed to just collecting and raking in that money. And I find some evidence that um, people report higher workplace practices um, after the adoption of right to work laws. In particular, people report that they're being treated more as a partner at work, that there's more of an open and trusted work environment after the adoption of these laws. So again, it's not perfect evidence, but it's at least suggestive of something within the workplace changing after states adopt these laws, as opposed to a purely composition-based effect. So to wrap up, um, what I've hoped to kind of convey today is that um, right to work laws are an important type of labor market regulation, but they're a very unique labor market regulation because it has to do more than just the bundle of economic goods within an area. It also has to do with the coercion that a lot of people feel when the union is representing them and they don't want to be represented by it. And so for the first time, Gallup has provided this data that allows me to say something causal about how subjective well-being and how people's economic economic sentiment is responding in, in, uh, in terms of this adoption of state right to work laws. And it's a result that seems remarkably robust across different statistical estimators. And my hope is that it will lead to a more data-driven discussion where unions don't view every um, argument about right to work laws as a uh, attack against them, but just as a call towards what's maybe better for workers and maybe what, what do workers actually want rather than kind of just imposing their, their views um, and what they think workers want. So um, hopefully a push towards more more data-driven decision-making. And with that, um, I'll let um, Will come up. And thanks so much for your attention and happy to answer questions afterwards. All agents need discipline, uh, and uh, unions are no exception. Neither are panelists. Thank you for staying on, on target. And it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Will Bode, who is the, I'm going to pronounce this uh, wrong, Neubauer. Is that right? Neubauer, I think. Neubauer, they don't, OK. Family Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, and uh, Will, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, so this is a really fa uh, fascinating paper full of interesting findings on a question that's just really important. Uh, as Chris has mentioned, uh, the Supreme Court has a case pending right now that I was, I was on my iPad a few minutes ago just making sure it hadn't come out you know, while we were sitting here, uh, but pending about sort of the constitutional rights of workers uh, to not have to support a union, which sort of goes to, in, in essence, how much should the the right to work doctrine be constitutionalized? And that decision concerns public sector unions. There will be follow on cases about private sector unions and about a lot of other things like that. So this is a this is a live topic in sort of constitutional litigation and regulation, uh, and so it's important to figure out what's what's going on here. And I guess my main sort of thoughts here and, and where I'm hoping to direct some of some of the conversation and some of your questions as well is sort of how to how to translate this data into policy and how to figure out what what is really going on here and what sort of implications might that have for for why this works and what directions to take it and this is something I mean this is something again that Christos tries to tease out in the paper uh, but some of the answers may require us to, to use logic and to use things other than the just there may not be enough data power to answer this purely by by number crunching so I guess I, I want to invite us all to to think about it in a slightly broader lens so step one so right to work laws what does that mean because uh, of course we all have a we all have a right to work in a colloquial sense like the government can't just stop you from from working but it means something more specific in the union context right it means that uh, your employer and your union can't set up a system 
where you have to be a member of the union and have to be a dues paying member of the union if you want to work. So even though your workplace is unionized, you have the right to to work there anyway and to not to not join. You can't be sort of compelled to be a member. And then the theory goes, in addition to not being compelled to be a member, you can't be compelled to pay the dues that members have to pay. So unions for a while were happy to say, fine, join, don't join, we don't care, as long as we get your money. Uh, and right to work laws say they can't do that either. Um, now, that doesn't get rid of a lot of the other things unions do. So unions still have an obligation to, when they collectively bargain, they still have an obligation to bargain for all of the employees. So it's not like there's a two-tier system where the union employees make $20 an hour and the non-union employees only make $15 an hour or something like that. Uh, the union's sort of obligations are still there in general. It's just now it can't count on uh, everybody being forced to pay up. So they have to do something else to, to provide value or to do something they want to get people to join. So, so, that's the, so that's the setup, right? So the right to work log, uh, then the question is why, so why does this make people happier, right? Why does this make people better off? And there's actually, there's, there's a, such a rich range of possibilities and it could be a lot of them, it could be some mix of them. And some of them, I think some of the data might help us pick one of the others, but some I think we just may have to think about. So one possibility, the most uh, cynical or sort of straightforward possibility at the same time, would be well, people are, are better off because they like free riding. You know, so you get to work in a unionized workplace, but you don't have to pay the union anymore. So you just get more money in your pocket every day. And that's great. Uh, you know, why, who, who wouldn't like getting something for nothing? Uh, so maybe the, the laws are better for that reason. Um, that's the, sort of the story that unions would, would like you to believe. So the unions would say, over time, this will be unsustainable because there, there are more and more free riders, you know, the whole system will fall apart. But in the short run, sure, people like the idea of, of getting something for nothing. Um, but I expect that's not all that's going on here. Uh, now, another possibility is these laws uh, improve satisfaction and outcomes because they weaken the union. So we could play the story out one, one step later and say, well, so the right to work law means you don't have to join the union. And over time, that system unravels. And so maybe fewer and fewer people will join the union. And maybe that just means it's really hard to have unions in right to work states at all. Uh, and so maybe it just sort of like weakens the powers of unions in general. And maybe that's why people are better off, because maybe unions are bad all, overall. Maybe they just, they're a net, uh, you know, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally. Maybe they're just a net drain on productivity and happiness and satisfaction. So maybe the outcome is really just this is a sort of soft way of, of hurting unions, and maybe that's why everybody's better off. Now, uh, another possibility, the, the flip side would be maybe they, maybe they make the unions better, that, that was sort of uh, one of the stories Christos had from the, the data, was that actually it's not that the unions are weakened so much as they become more competitive. They have to do more to, to win the hearts and minds and pocketbooks of the workers that they're trying to get on board. So that, that could be too. Uh, so it could be that it's not so much that, that this is just a, a way of, of crushing unions as it's a way of, of improving them making, them, making them leaner and better. Uh, and that's why they make everybody make everybody happier. Um, so those and those are all sort of like local stories. Those are stories about the the interactions of the worker in the workplace. But then it also could be there's something going on in the bigger picture. And again, I think a little bit of the data is trying to trying to get at this. Although I, I, it doesn't seem like there's quite enough statistical power to to be sure of these stories yet. So so another possibility is well. These right-to-work laws, especially the ones adopted in Indiana and Wisconsin and so the states during the change during the sample, are usually not just like a one-off, this law is the only thing that happens, right? These are uh, governors, Scott Walker, et cetera, like who, who have a legislature who are pushing through a sort of package of business-related reforms. Uh, and maybe it's some combination of the package that's really doing a lot of the work. So maybe it's not so much, I mean, it's not just a right to work law that works. Like maybe if California somehow like everybody, I don't know, collectively hit their heads and adopted a right to work law, even though it's not the kind of thing the California legislature would normally do, maybe that wouldn't actually change that much. Maybe you've got to really go the full Scott Walker uh, to get whatever the benefits are. And it's like there's something in that whole package that, 
that helps, uh, you know, that helps uh, workers. And that, in turn, could be either, again, economic. It could be that it's, you know, various forms of deregulation that improve the sort of day-to-day -day in the workplace. Or it could be more emotional. You know, it could be that somehow just the set of regulations make people feel more, value, more valued. It makes them feel like the government's on their side. And that's a lot of what they're reporting. I'm not sure. Or some combination of the two. But, that, but again, it could be the, the broader picture. Um, and then there's also, also another version of this that uh, it could be that the policies, you know, the, the full Scott Walker, uh, affect businesses. The businesses are more likely to move to Wisconsin and Indiana than Illinois. Uh, certainly there are not a lot of businesses moving to Illinois at the moment. Um, and maybe just the, the businesses moving there creates, in general, increased economic growth and opportunity and a sense of, you know, <laughs> dynamism and all that stuff. So, so it could be that it's, again, it's the, the full panoply of policies, and then it could be either its effect on the worker or its effect on, on the economy as a whole. Like, and this all points in the same direction, that, you know, something is, something's going on with these laws that's good. <laughs> uh, but if we're going to figure out what to do next and how much, you know, how much will a Supreme Court decision that's specifically focused on the right to work laws help workers versus how much is it really about, uh, you know, electing the right kind of legislature and the right kind of governor who have a broader vision of economic regulation, uh, figure out which of those two things it is. Uh, might make a might make a big difference, and similarly, I think f for for a lot of these, you know, figuring how much it's uh, the mechanism of of weakening the unions, strengthening the unions, or something else going on, could help us figure out you know in what sectors of the economy we should be doing this, and and again, how much you know wh where a lot of the action is. I guess I'd say, and this is sort of maybe the the biggest picture of all. You know, one possibility is that this is a paper about unions. So, which is the way you present it is unions are an economic entity. They're currently regulated in one way. If we regulate them this other way, we'll all be, you know, workers are better off. The other possibility is that that unions are kind of just a, a bubble on the tide. Uh, and that, you know, really it's not just about unions, but it's about some broader picture of economic regulation and the workplace. And it happens that it includes that you know that unions are part of this story, but but it's something really really much bigger. And given how little of the American workforce is unionized these days, you know it would be in some sense the most uh, exciting and the most important if it's the second. If this is not just a paper about unions, but a paper about you know the the Scott Walker package or about sort of like how states regulate uh, the economy. Uh, and maybe you know maybe it's not. If it's just a paper about unions, that's still important to the to the millions of people who work for them. But, but it could be something, it could be something bigger or it could be something more modest. Christos, why don't you take a minute to respond and we'll open up for questions. Yeah, well, thank you, Will. Um, let me just say, yeah, I do think it's definitely part of a broader um, conversation about regulation. One thing I've looked at with this reg data database from Mercatus is looking at the growth of regulations in states that adopt right-to-work laws, and it does seem to be that the growth of regulations overall seems to be declining in response to these right-to-work laws. So I don't think it's an isolated thing by any um, means, and, and so I agree with that assessment for sure. In terms of the mechanisms, and maybe this will be something that we talk about more in the question and answer period, but um, there's a lot of possibilities as well pointed towards. Um, I don't... And so when the unions say it's just a free riding issue, um, that's something that I test for in the paper because in the Gallup data, I can actually see somebody's income bracket and I can also see how much they report in terms of consumption. So if it's that they're getting more money and they don't need to pay the union dues, you would expect that to be showing up in terms of consumption. When you control for consumption or you control for income, you don't find any statistically distinguishable effects. So it doesn't seem to be um, that it's like the, the, that the union concern that it's just free riding is driving the story. Um, in terms of the other mechanisms, it's something that I don't want to take up time now and we might just get to in the Q&A period but um, for sure I think that there's um, the, the possibility that states are changing a lot of different ways and that's why I try to approach it using this um, these different types of estimators and the difference in difference approach and so on so um, the data is imperfect just because of as you pointed Will is that there's a small number of workers this is only 10 years um, and unions were very strong in the 1970s I can't go back to the 1970s with Gallup so there's just some inherent limitations but um, maybe we can bring up some of those and the let me follow up before I open it up, because I thought that, and I don't want to uh, defend you more than you're going to defend yourself, but <laughs> I thought there were two pieces of evidence that you presented that that were somewhat convincing that this is um, coming from the right to work laws rather than other things. The, the two pieces to me were first that it was concentrated in union employees, so it's not just a general feel good mm -hmm. thing. And the second piece of evidence is that the Mercatus regulation uh, indicators 
Now, that's not, that doesn't include state-level things. That's just federal. However, what it shows is that regulatory change, per se, doesn't affect sentiment. Yeah. Or, so that, that, that's why, even though I agree that Will's point is valid, it seemed like you have some evidence, at least, that, that responds directly to it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally agree. And so it seems to be that there's something unique about right to work changing the agency of people's decisions versus just overall economic regulations that might change business activity and the fact that it's concentrated among union members. Because if the story that – so the most plausible story is that unions are on the decline, and so the, the states that are adopting right to work laws are able to attract more um, employment, but maybe in um, other sorts of uh, professional services sectors, et cetera. And so the fact that this is kind of concentrated in unions suggests that that it's, it's something that's unique to right to work, but not at the expense of um, other uh, broader regulation. So, I mean, it, there's this complementarity that when you pass right to work and you pass maybe other deregulation measures, maybe you get, um, like, what's that phrase? Like, the, it's the whole is more than the sum of its parts. I think some Greek person said it. And, and, but, uh, yeah, so I don't know, Charlie, maybe it you know. Me. Okay, yeah. Um, but anyways, the point being is that maybe there's complementary effects between different types of deregulations. Okay, we have plenty of time for comments. <laughs> I'm going to make a cue. And I All tried hands. to collect comments last time, and I wasn't successful because uh, the, the uh, panelists like to respond. So uh, what I'm going to do is this time I'm going to try again, but we'll see if, if they want to collect them. So I have Jennifer first, uh, then this young man, and uh, Diana, and then I'll keep collecting. So this is a really interesting paper, and I also very much enjoyed your comments. I want to not follow your comment, though, and go to the empirical method. So I would love to see a table, particularly since uh, going to table one here, um, uh, almost all your action is happening in this little period here, right? So it would be where it looks to me like it's a handful of states. So I would like to see a zero set at around when these things, I mean, you're just really looking in this paper at the very last blip there, right? So I'd like to see a zero set at that and then see parallel trends in the states that did or didn't change these sort of on a, I don't know, monthly basis. Because your diff and diff is relying on parallel trends, not only union and non-union within the states that are right to work, but a parallel trends assumption that they were par the two states were parallel before and after. And since you're starting at the financial crisis and largely studying the change in economic satisfaction after the financial crisis, where I would assume that's being hugely impacted by how badly were you hit by it, and how quickly did you recover, California being incredibly hit, and Florida and Nevada. I mean, so I think we need to see what's happening with the parallel trends before, what's happening after, and I wouldn't mind a little control for housing prices, right? Because that's certainly going to affect your, your satisfaction. How much is your house tanking, right, as a result of the financial crisis, and what's happening you know, I think that's a confounding omitted variable that is worth taking a look at. Do you mind if I collect a few? Okay, go for it. Okay. So, Diana. I think it's a really great paper. Congratulations. It's really nice to see this quantified. Uh, employers like to locate in right-to-work states that attracts more employment. We can just look at the auto industries comparing BMW and Mercedes in the south with uh, the big three in, um, <coughs> in <coughs> excuse me, Michigan. Uh, you might want to look at some of these counties that are becoming right to work in case you want to mm. do an analysis of the overall state regulation versus right to work. Kentucky had counties that are right to work. Now Ohio is having counties that are right to work. So that will enable you to separate those two in case you feel like extending your analysis. Great. Um, and I have a young man right here. Could you identify yourself, please? Hi, my name is Daniel DiMartino. Yeah, um, I also think that the paper was really great, uh, but I think that also there's something else that could give a lot of insight into, and that is public sector unions specifically. So a lot of states are now restricting collective bargaining, and they're restricting uh, joining unions, and of course, basically right to work within the public sector. And it would be interesting to see what's the effect of right to work laws in government efficiency, in uh, how much does the state spend on resources for employees and these kinds of kinds of effects which are also important for the rest of society. 
So I'm Price Fishback. Um, I'm a little bit worried because the results show that the non-union guys have a negative effect and that the union guys have a big, powerful, positive effect. And it struck me that you might want to think about relative incomes in these kind of contexts because they may look good relative to lower income guys. The other thing is, is the, um, you were talking about your first and second hypotheses. I'm having trouble with the first one because the compensating wage differences literature typically shows that unionized and larger firms tend to have better benefits, tend to have a better overall package than the other thing. So I'm more convinced about the competition story that you're telling where the unions have to fight harder to get people to, to pay dues and things like that. Yeah, great. Um, so, uh, Jennifer, great uh, uh, points. Um, so, the, I did have a, I have a button here that goes to the parallel trans assumption. Um, and so, I, I've checked that, and it does, it seems to check out. One of the challenges, obviously, is that the sample that I have is not huge, so I can't do like a ton of pre and post indicators. But I think I put in the paper maybe like two, two lags on it, and it seems to, that there's no, there's no statistically significant pre trend. Um, in the main specification with this G um, polynomial, I do also control for state employment growth, housing prices, um, because as you said, um, variation in housing price shocks and housing wealth shocks is going to be an important factor during these years. Um, and then um, I also, with the balancing test, where I try to take a permutation of characteristics and match the treated and control um, observations, I try both synthetic controls and also this balancing es uh, entropy es estimator. So um, maybe we can talk, uh, if you have further questions, we can talk more about that. Um, uh, Diana, um, yeah, yeah I, the great point. I should get um, a list of counties where it's been adopted, and then you have even better variation at a local level about where um, people adopted it and where um, compared to other counterparts. Um, Daniel, um, yeah, that's something that I could explore further in this paper with uh, public uh, union workers. Um, there's an indicator that I've constructed that lets me see if the person's like a government worker or a private sector worker. Um, I've looked at, at some of the interaction effects. Um, the standard errors are just a little bit high because the sample is a little bit smaller in those narrow cells, but um, those effects do seem to be coming through. And then also a broader project looking at public spending um, and how that changes after the adoption of right to work would be a, a good follow-up. Um, price, um, let's see, so uh, with non-union work, yeah, so with the unionized firms, so the, the studies that all look at like the benefits packages for union firms, those are, uh, I think those are, are fairly convincing that overall they have like better health benefits, et cetera. Um, what I was thinking about um, was other sorts of non-wage amenities like development and training opportunities, the degree to which people feel like they're being managed and managed well and given feedback. Those sorts of non-wage benefits um, are hard to measure, but we're using some other data um, in partnership with payscale.com. It seems to be that those other sorts of non-wage amenities are very important predictors of job satisfaction and engagement. So that's what I had more in mind, and it seems to be that those are lower in unionized jobs. For example, I've used o data from ONET where they measure the degree of flexibility at an occupational level, and the degree of flexibility is a lot lower in more heavily unionized occupations. Um, with regard to just like the effect being concentrated among, or that is sort of negative among non-union workers, the main um, table, I mean, you do see this overall positive effect and then like a point 0 0.029, and then to the extent that there's just like a kind of noisy uh, point zero, minus point zero zero four is just like, you I mean, so it could be slightly negative, it could be slightly positive, it's just kind of a, a noisy um, uh, confidence interval, but I agree, I mean, it's, I would have expected maybe like a slight positive effect on the on the direct effect of right-to-work laws, um, but I mean, that you're right that I, yeah. Um, I mean, it's possible that there's like a slight difference because I think I changed one of the specifications here to put day and day of the year fixed effects instead of month and year. But um, in any case, yeah, so it's it's slightly negative, but the main table shows like that it's overall positive and it's just concentrated among. Uh, I want to reiterate Jennifer's point that you've you've got very limited variation for your diffs and diffs estimator. That as I as I read your the 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 narrative. Michigan and Indiana adopted these laws in 2012. West Virginia, 2015, or uh, 16. Wisconsin, 2015. Missouri and Kentucky, 2017. So there's six states in there. But of those, since your data start in um, 2012, is that right? 2008. Yeah. So Michigan and Indiana will be in. Missouri and Kentucky are out because they're 2017, you're not really going to have after for, for them. So I'd, I'd be a bit concerned about that. The other thing is the magnitudes, um, they are significant. You got millions of observations, and I, I understand that you do cluster at the state level. 
but it, like 0 0.02 tenths of 1% of a standard deviation on a scale of 1 to 10 doesn't strike me as all that big of an effect. And then your large effect is 11% uh, of a standard deviation. So I, I just wonder how big they are. And then I have one sort of uh, comment about you know, the, the unobserved factors. And that is that um, you know, two of my colleagues have just written a paper about why are stock returns on average higher during Democratic administrations than during Republican administration. Will is nodding his head. And, and the idea is that, and I think they make a convincing case that um, Democratic administrations are elected when people are very risk averse during, during a crisis, so returns are higher. And uh, Republican administrations are elected when people are feeling pretty good. Now, I dare to say that there aren't many of these laws that are passed by Democratic administrations, that these are mainly Republican administrations. And you're relying on this narrow group of states the, and you find that these guys are happier when they've just passed a right to work law. Well, there's, a, of course, a lot more going on, as Will pointed out, and some of it may just be general economic conditions. Now, the fact that it's concentrated among union members in that context doesn't surprise me that much either because uh, union, the you know, manufacturing and other union sectors are, f are generally found to be much more cyclically sensitive than non-union non sectors made up of people like us. So that uh, th the idea that it's solely attributable to the right to work laws, I think, remains to be shown. Uh, so I'm curious about what would be the, uh, about a possible corollary to right to work laws. Shouldn't there be a corollary right to work is also the right to stiff non-members laws so that uh, it, shouldn't it be that unions are permitted to negotiate a contract with the employer uh, in which union members have a higher wage scale than non-union members? First of all, just as a matter of sort of logic and fairness and libertarian principle, isn't that so? And if so, I wonder, what, if you'd speculate as to whether they would actually do that, and if they did actually do that, that would surely cause divisiveness and 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 have the um, macritus factors uh, plummeting. I think. Uh, up front, I'll uh, have to admit that um, I had some trouble following all this. It was like following the bouncing ball. Um, but I come from a background not in economics. I have a background in formal education in uh, science and law. So maybe I'll approach it from a scientific basis. Uh, first of all, there are so many variables going on here, uh, some subjective, some which can be measured, but so many variables, time, place, uh, subjective views of individuals. So it's hard to for me to uh, con conceive and isolate some of these things. But first, you can't do double-blind testing like you can with uh, other things, uh, particularly in medical terms. Um, secondly, I think uh, it's a little bit like vaccination. Uh, in order for unions to be effective, you have to reach a certain number and large majority in order for them to be effective and negotiate um, and third, um, you talk about entropy here. I've never heard of entropy being used outside of uh, scientific terms. So as long as you're introducing entropy, how about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, where if you can tell the uh, speed of a moving particle, you can't tell where it's located. And uh, conversely, if you can tell where it is, you can't tell what its speed is. I mean, there are lots of things going on here. Uh, Chrysos, why don't you take those? I have two more on my list, and then we'll, we'll be done. Quickly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Robert, yeah, I think that, yeah, limited state-level variation. There's only um, so much you can do with the Gallup data. One thing that I've done is um, instead of uh, exploiting this within state variation is just using the cross-sectional variation and trying to do a better job of matching treated and control um, states. Um, kind of, I think Jesus mentioned this back uh, during our, our – 
maybe multiple people mentioned it, but um, so with the cross-sectional estimates, I get kind of similar results, which makes me think that it's not purely um, a power issue. Um, the other issue regarding the magnitude is that it's actually because the outcome variable is in terms of a z-score with the standard deviation of one and a mean of zero, um, the 0 .037 um, is, is not insignificant, especially when you compare it with the college attainment measure. Um, and then lastly, with regard to state legislatures and uh, Republicans being more likely to be in control, um, I think that's going on and I, I certainly can't rule that out. I think that's one of the uh, a good um, uh, possibility. And one thing I've explored is looking at at a state level legislature changes um, and trying to so I can control for that. It doesn't make the effects go away, but nonetheless, there's only so much you can do with these regression based methods. And I think you're right that there's something there, uh, Michael. Um, I, I think you're right that that would create a lot of divisiveness if there was like two separate uh, structures for union uh, paying union members and non-union, and um, I, the the workplace probably would deteriorate um, if uh, yeah if that happened. I hope maybe maybe we can write a paper about the uh, the counterfactual world of what we would do if uh, that happened. But um, and then Herb. Um, Lots of moving factors here, and that's kind of where that's how a lot of applied microeconomists have a job is because we try to isolate the factors that are at play in a very complex world, and that's why I tried to control for certain things. And um, and I think really what somebody has to win is that at the time that a state passes right to work, that that that. Um, there's other things that are happening that are correlated with the unobserved determinants of subjective well-being. And I've tried to just rule out some of the typical examples um, to suggest about what's going on. But I can't rule out all of them, that's for sure. So I just want to say, I'm not so sure that the that this uh, partial unionization thing would lead to divisiveness. So if you imagine that... You, yeah, well, okay. Oh, yeah? And if you and if you imagine that people uh, can choose to opt in to either the union package and they pay the dues for it if it's worth it, or they can uh, opt out, you know, I think you'd see people pick whichever one they thought was a better deal for them. You m it might lead, to, if anything, to a lemon problem where the people who opt out are the superstars who think they can, you know, yeah, the productive. Yeah, they have a, like a super special. They can negotiate a super special deal, and everybody else takes the standard package. And then, as more and more superstars leave the standard, pa the standard pool, maybe the wage goes down over time, and all things unravels. Although, you know, if there are only a few superstars, not necessarily. But, but it's not as obvious to me that that's an unworkable uh, yeah. situation, especially if it's actually happening. Most, <clears throat> most firms are not fully unionized because you have service workers in the union, technical workers who tend not to be unionized. And then you have the group that's re the collective bargaining unit that's oftentimes on the factory floor and things along those lines. Right. So the union has different classes of workers, <clears throat> some of which are unionized. Right. Because right. if you've got a class of workers or whatever, then, and 50% and or more vote for it, then they have to be unionized right. in that context. Right. So, so at the University of Chicago, some of the classes of instructors have, are, are now unionized, but the, you know, the tenure track professors are not. Uh, so even there, you have a, a mix. I think one difference here would be it'd be more possible for somebody without changing their job title to float in or out of the union to say, right, and that's that's the you know the possible unraveling we just talked about. Sorry, Christos, did you have any other comments before we take the last two questions? No, I'll, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so this gentleman here, and then John Wallace is the last one, and we're already out of time. So I'm sorry. How are you doing? Uh, my name is. Um, Andrew Castillo. Um, so I just have a simple question. Um, just why is it that um, uh, uh, I'm just speaking on um, figure two? Um, why is it um, that uh, predominantly the uh, states that vote liberal um, the, on the West Coast and then the states that vote liberal also on the East Coast, um, they don't have uh, the right to work laws? Um, and then, you know, I guess in the Bible Belt and the uh, Middle America, they do have right to work laws. Is there a correlation to that or? John Wallace, last question, and then Christos will answer. I'd like to second Mike's libertarian point um, about shouldn't the rules treat everybody the same? And this is the or there's there's rules about the organization of one factor of production, labor, that are very different than the rules for the organization of another factor of production, capital. Um, and these are about how the, the organizational structure of labor, right? And right to work is part of that balance. Um, and I think there's a, a, a larger frame in which that's, those questions are really, really interesting. To this point, and this echoes price, it, your empirical results are all union members are better off. That's the, that's the empirical result when you get a right to work law. Um, and I think you really want to have a, a, more of a focus on that. 
uh, it, be, it could be they're more competitive. It could be the value of being in a socially organized group is more valuable when there's less organizations. There's all kinds of possible things there, but you really want to focus on on your result <laughs> uh, rather than the frame. Can, just to follow up on that, can it also be that right to work laws increase the um, amount of capital that gets imported into the state for unionized workers. You know, for, think about South Carolina and the automobile, ma you know, manufacturing and other things there. So, anyway, sorry to add to that, but yeah, no, I think, and I think you referenced um, back in our first meeting the paper by uh, Hassett and, and or Falik and Hassett where investment goes up in response to um, declines in unionization. So, I think that's definitely true. Um, and then, so, yeah, John, yeah, I, sh I, you're right. I should emphasize those results more, and then. Um, and then, Andrew, um, I think one of the reasons why you see the spatial heterogeneity is just based off of the variation in um, Republican versus Democrat. Um, I should do a correlation just between the share of voters within a state and, like, how that predicts right-to-work laws. I'd expect to see a larger share of Republicans being very positively correlated with the adoption of right-to-work. But I think that would probably explain a decent amount of it. Well, it's a mark of a good paper that it raises so many questions, and I'm very happy with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you.